We are at the Kloster Etel Abbey right now. I'm in uh, Southern Germany visiting some family, visiting from friends, and I'm at this place where there's monks that have dedicated their lives, where they have chose to follow God with their entire life at this place. And you look at the, the gold, the statues, the carvings, you see how many people, hundreds of years worth of believers and followers of Christ that have dedicated their lives to glorifying and lifting up Christ. The journey that God took them on. This is part of that journey and celebrating and lifting him up. What is the journey God has you on today? That's what we're gonna be looking at with Pastor John. So glad you're joining us for Pure Heart Church Online. Welcome to church. If there's purpose in the valley, then use me here. I'll stay right here. If there's peace within the chaos, then find me here, God, I'll be right here. When the sea gets a little uneasy, it doesn't mean you've left me, it doesn't mean you're gone. When my heart feels a little unrested, it doesn't mean it's over, it doesn't mean
good job singing that song, I will trust in you. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend for our online campus. We are truly honored that you are spending this time with us. So let me ask you a question. Why did you start following Jesus? Think about it. Now, all of us come to faith for various reasons. For me, I was young. I was just a little bit shy of my 12th birthday. And it was mainly out of fear that I was going to miss the rapture. And as a kid, I really didn't like the prospects of having to fight the Antichrist by myself. But then, you know, as as an 11 year old boy, the real problem was this. I was trying to figure out what am I gonna eat for seven years? So it was out of that fear that I gave my life to Christ. And of course, the Lord has done an incredible work in my life since then. Uh, Some of you may have came to Jesus out of desperation. You were at the end of your rope seeking a better life. Some of you may have been on an intellectual pursuit, a truth quest, if you will, and you found the case for Christ compelling, and so you said yes to following Jesus. Maybe some of you just simply wanted a fire insurance policy. If you don't get that, think about it. You might get it later. Now, for others of you, it was possibly a long and difficult process that may have taken years. But you finally got to the point where you received this revelation in your heart that what Jesus spoke about in the Gospels was absolutely true. That what it tells us in John 3.16, that God loved the world so much that he gave his son, and if we simply believe in him, we would have everlasting life. That became a revelation in your heart. Maybe for some of you, it was a little bit easier. You grew up in a God-fearing home, and when you heard the message for the very first time, something just clicked inside of you. You said yes, and you've never looked back. But regardless, at one time or another, all of us have asked in some form, what is the real purpose of the Christian life? Is it just to escape the possibility of hell and just look forward to heaven? Or is it more than that? Is it so we can live a good life and devote ourselves to social justice so that we can make the world a better place? Why should we become followers of Jesus and and dedicate our lives to him? Why do we do this? Why do we follow? Now, fortunately for us, Jesus narrowed this down and he really answered the question for us just hours before he was to go to the cross and give his life. We read in John 17, Jesus spoke these things, looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you since you gave him authority over all people so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. So that's the purpose to give eternal life. But then what I love is that in this very next verse, Jesus defines for us what eternal life is. Watch what he says. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. So what we find here in what Jesus told us is that this idea of eternal life, it's not so much about a quantity of life as it is about a quality of life, the quality of knowing God, the quality of becoming intimately acquainted with God and all that he is, his character and his nature. And what I love about this prayer that Jesus is praying for us, he's saying, look, out of all the options out there, and I think all of us would agree that there are a lot of options out there, things that we can do with our life. But out of all the options out there, all the things that we could put our trust in and put our lives toward and put our affections toward, Jesus said, ultimately, God's desire is that we would know him. Paul, decades later, echoes this idea in Philippians chapter 3, where he said, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection 
and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Not that I've already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take a hold of it. But one thing I do, I forget what is behind, reach forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. That is exactly what God wants for us now that we've chosen to follow Jesus, that we would know him. And as Paul said, this is a goal. This is something that we press toward. I I love the imagery that's used there. And I'm a huge uh, fan of track and field. I love watching track and field events. And I love runners as they're coming down the stretch toward the finish line. They're pressing and that's really the idea that Paul's trying to get across to us here is that we're running and we're we're pressing ahead, but we're doing it with purpose. And we're not, we're not going full on Forrest Gump here where he was just decided one day to go for a run and, and then said, I just ran for no reason whatsoever. No, we don't do that. We run with a purpose, with a goal, and that goal is to know God. Athanasius was a bishop of... Christianity in the city of Alexandria way back in the fourth century. And he was a really influential figure in the early church. He helped to shape what the early church believed about our relationship with God. And I love what he said here in one of his works. For of what use is existence to the creature if it cannot know its maker? And why should God have made them at all if he had not intended them to know him? But God has given them a share in his own image, that is, in our Lord Jesus Christ, and has made them after the same image and likeness. Why? That through him, that is through Jesus, to apprehend the Father, which knowledge of their maker is for men the only really happy and blessed life. So what we see here is that living a truly happy and blessed life is really only possible by intimately knowing God. You and I, everyone that is part of God's creation as human beings, we were created in God's image. We were perfect and sinless. But in the beginning of time, humanity chose to know other things other than God. And what it did is it spiraled us away from the perfection of life that we enjoyed. But Jesus came to get us back on the path of knowing God. And it's only through him that we can ascend back up to this knowledge of God in the way that it was originally intended. Now, it would be really nice, I'll be honest with you, it'd be really nice if we could just be teleported there immediately where, bam, we are there, we know God, and it's it's all a one and done. But what we see is that it's something that we have to press toward because there's things that war against us and try to take us away from the life that God intends for us. You see, along this pathway of knowing God, there's this idea of a journey. And I I absolutely love that word journey. It's one of my favorite words. And journey is, it's a noun, it's a verb, and yeah, it's a band, okay? Now, as a noun, it is simply an act of getting from one place to another. But as a verb, journey carries the idea of action, and adventure and going somewhere, like going on a voyage or going on an expedition. And what we see in the scripture is that life is just one big journey that's filled with thousands of smaller journeys within. And that's how our spiritual life is defined. And each of us, whether we even realize it or not, we've been invited to go on this journey, this expedition with God to know him. And this is a journey that's filled with challenge and beauty and adventure, and it's laden with moments of jubilation, tragedy, struggle, and triumph. You know, what? one of the things that I found out about traveling this journey is that the journey with God, there's times when it's going to make you feel invincible, that you can do absolutely anything and nothing and no one can take you down. But at other times, let's be honest, the journey is difficult. There's going to be moments when you'll need to lean on the strength of God to pull you out of the ditches of dysfunction and strengthen you in those very testing moments. 
Other times on the journey, you're gonna need others to come alongside of you and pick you up and carry you because you realize in those challenging moments that you can't do it alone. And this journey with God, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not as the skeptics would say that it's something that's for the weak-minded and the faint-hearted who just need the crutch of religion to cope with the harsh realities of life. But this journey is for anyone who recognizes that in this broken and messed up world that we live in, you know what? The resources of man just aren't enough to fix what is wrong. One of the most prominent philosophers of the last few hundred years was Nietzsche. And yeah, Nietzsche was an atheist and he got a lot wrong in what he said and what he wrote, but there was one thing that he got right. Nietzsche said, along the journey, we commonly forget its goal. Now let's pause just for a second here. And I, I don't know if you guys are like me, but maybe you've gone somewhere before and you forget why you're going. You know, I, I gotta be real with you guys. I'm that guy that if my wife sends me to the grocery store for a loaf of bread, um, a jar of milk, and a stick of butter, I'm calling her saying, hey, what, what was the third thing that you sent me for? I, I got milk and I got bread. What, what was the third thing? And it's even that way at home. I mean, I could get up from my bedroom and walk into the kitchen and stand there in the kitchen and scratch my head as to why I even got up and went to the kitchen in the first place. Now, I may be the only one that that's ever happened to, but I, I suspect that some of you can relate to that. And you know, things happen along life's journey that takes its toll on us. Our own mistakes, our failures, maybe rejection that comes from others in our life, our own hurts, habits, and hangups that we deal with, and all these things will happen and then occasionally they'll resurface in our life over time and they become barriers to knowing God intimately. And, and here's what can happen. We can become so consumed by the journey itself. Now don't miss this. We can become so consumed by the journey itself that like Nietzsche said, we forget the goal. We forget what we are pressing for, which is what? Which is to know him. You know, we speak about uh, knowing God intimately. And it's interesting when you start throwing out words like intimacy to describe our relationship with God, some people just shut down. And a lot of guys will shut down because it's like, yeah, that whole intimate thing, it sounds kind of weird. But let me encourage you on something. Here's how we should think of the word intimacy. So j just for the next few moments, whatever notions you have about the word intimacy, set those things aside. And I want you to think of it this way. Intimacy means into me sees. Think about that. When I have intimacy with God, he sees into me. I open my life up to him relationally. I said yes to him. I want to follow him. I want to know him. And that means I'm going to allow him to see into my life. I'm going to be vulnerable with my Lord and Savior. And as he looks into me, he sees my pain. He sees my struggle. He sees my doubt, my, my fear. And I'm able to open up to God about heartache and disillusionment. My life, when I seek to be intimate with God, my life becomes open. But you know, the, the beauty is that the reverse of this is also true. When I have intimacy with God, not only does he see into me, but I see into him. I see his character. I see his nature, I see his eternal goodness, that he's a personal, relational being who truly desires to have that relationship with us into me, sees. So we have the goal. Jesus prayed that for us is that, that we would have eternal life and eternal life defined as knowing God. We know that God wants to have this. We know that it's a journey, that it doesn't happen overnight. But the reality is this, ladies and gentlemen, there is only one road to get us there. There's only one pathway to get us to God. And that pathway is through Jesus Christ himself. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, 
You will also know my father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. I love this verse. It's such a pivotal verse for our faith. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And here's what I've found over the years in in, in helping people walk this journey with Jesus. A lot of people say, you know what? I want the life that Jesus came to bring. I mean, what's not to love about that? Jesus said in John 10, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And that's what we want. We want this eternal life. We want this quality of life. We pursue knowing him in that regard. And, And to do that, we accepted the truth about who Jesus was. But here's the thing, we cannot expect to simply acknowledge the truth about Jesus and go after the life of Jesus if we are not willing to go the way of Jesus. He is the way and the truth and the life. So here's your big takeaway for this weekend, and this is what I really want to focus in on in the moments that we have left together. Now write this down if you're taking notes somewhere. Here it is. It is only when the Jesus way is joined with the Jesus truth that we get the Jesus life. Let me bring you into my world as a pastor just just for a moment. And and I've been doing this for for many, many years now, going on 32 years of full-time pastoral ministry. And I I love my my work. I love what I do for God's kingdom. But I I just for a moment, I want to bring you into this world. Because for many of you, I see you once a week, maybe once a month or whenever you come or if you, you know, you're watching online, this is really the only way that, that I actually get to, to be with you and spend time with you. Maybe perhaps I'll talk to you on the phone or through text or through email or, or your social media posts, but here, here's the truth. I don't know what goes on in the daily details of your life. I mean, I might know the big picture of like where you work, what maybe your health situation is, but... I don't know your ways. And my grandmother on my mom's side of the family, she was uh, just a a Southern lady from the state of Kentucky. And she had a saying that I heard repeatedly growing up. She would say this, she'd say, well, he has good ways. She has good ways. Now, what I find interesting about that is that my grandma, who was a busybody, I'm gonna be honest with you, she was a busybody. She wanted to know everybody's business, you know? And so I always wondered, well, wait a minute, even, even though you wanna know what's going on, how do you really know that they have good ways, that he or she has good ways? Well, see, your ways, that's simply your manner of life on your journey. It's the path that you're following, and the truth is, I really don't know if your ways are good or not. I can guess. You know, that's not healthy. That's not the way to go about it. Think of it this way. I don't know if what I or we as a teaching team here at Pure Heart, we don't know if what we're teaching you every weekend is really taking root in your heart and making a difference. I mean, we hope it is, but we really don't know. I don't know what the ways of your home are or what kind of things roll through your mind on the way to work, or I don't know the way that you talk to other drivers as you're driving to work. Nobody ever does that, right? Nobody talks to other drivers in their car, right? Okay. Or I don't know the way you converse with your spouse or your kids, your coworkers. I don't know what kind of an employee you are. I don't know the way you handle money or the way you watch news or your political leanings or how you process sexuality and other social issues or the way that, that, that you live. I don't know if you live out what you say you believe. The bottom line is, I don't know your ways. For decades now, there's been a little, uh, little acronym that's run around Christianity and we've asked the question, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I mean, it was a huge marketing campaign when it first happened. And, but you know what? I really think that as, as good as that question is, there's, there's actually a better question. The better question is H-D-J-D-I. How does Jesus do it? What are his ways? What is his manner of life? What is his path? Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, if I'm truly going to follow Jesus, if I'm going to pursue him, if I'm going to, as the goal is, if I'm going to know him, I need to know his ways. Prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus, 
made this powerful declaration. He said, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. Let the wicked one abandon his what? His way and the sinful one, his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord so he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will freely forgive. For my thoughts are not your thoughts and don't don't miss this, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For his heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And some of you watching right now may be thinking, well, John, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at my life. I'm self-evaluating here. I, I think I've got good ways. I hope so. I hope that your ways are being formed and shaped by his higher ways. And here's why. Because in Proverbs 16, 25, it tells us there is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. It's so important that we know which way we are following so that our ways can truly be shaped by him. So let me ask you this weekend, what shapes our ways? What is shaping the ways of your life right now? What I find with so many people, more often than not, their lives are being shaped by the way of culture. I'm a discipleship pastor, and I'm of the conviction that everybody whether they realize it or not, even if they're a follower of Jesus or not, everybody's being discipled by something or by someone. Our ways are being shaped. And we may think that our ways are good, but again, there's a way that seems right. And if we're not careful, that way can eventually lead us to death. That's why we have to evaluate where our ways are coming from. Now, often I find that My Christian brothers and sisters, they're embracing the ways of culture, specifically the American ways, things that are popular, charismatic, successful, and influential. And all these things are, they're they're nothing but attempts to substitute what seems right to us versus what is right in the eyes of God. See, here's what culture does, ladies and gentlemen. Culture takes the autonomous self and puts it at the top. Remember what God said, my ways are higher than your ways. No matter how much we try to put ourselves at the top, God's ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. And God's ways and thoughts are completely countercultural. Why? Because God is the one who is in charge. Remember, it is only when the Jesus way is joined with the Jesus truth that we get the Jesus life. And I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that there is a better way to live than the way of culture. There is a better way to do life, a better way to handle money, a better way to do marriage, a better way to raise kids, a better way to understand not only how to be human, but also how to embrace the divine. There's a better way to work, a better way to relate to one another. There is a better way of life, and that is the way of Jesus. Now, as a church, we at Pure Heart, we we know what we are all about. We, We talk about this all the time at Pure Heart. That is that together we are becoming like Jesus for the sake of others. So we know the what, but why do we do it? And I'll tell you why we do it. Why did we choose this to guide everything that we do? Why did we choose to together we're going to become more like Jesus for the sake of others? Why did we do it? I'll tell you why we do it. Because we've looked at the way of culture. We have seen the struggle of humanity and we've realized that there is indeed a better way. And that if we journey the better way together, we can truly fulfill the prayer of Christ and come to know him. The church is a beautiful thing. The church is the primary means by which the way of Jesus is embraced and the way that it's lived out. Church is so much more than a building. 
We are part of a universal, triumphant, living entity that is influencing the remote corners of this world. But ladies and gentlemen, when we come to a physical location, it is where it becomes local and it becomes personal. That's why those of you that are that are watching online, and this is your campus, you're watching online, it's so important that we try to connect you, even if it's not here, because you're watching in various parts of the world. It may not be here in Arizona, but we want you to connect with a physical representation of the body of Christ because we believe that the church is the place and community where we listen to and we start to live out the commandments of Christ, the way of Jesus. It's the place that we invite people to come and consider responding to Jesus' call to follow. It's a place for worship and prayer where people are baptized into an identity and prodded towards maturity. It's where we're continually challenged to a better way. It's where we're taught the way of Jesus, not just the what, but the how. If I'm being real with you guys, this is really where I'm struggling right now as a, as a local church leader. Because as I look around the landscape of, of our culture, and I'm just speaking specifically for the country that we live in, you know, American churches by and large are replacing the Jesus way with the American way. We seek what's popular, trendy, charismatic, and, and influential. And, you know, we got vision statements and catchy slogans and program-driven methodologies. And really, there's nothing inherently wrong with those things. But what they can do if we allow it to, they will erode the personal and replace intimacy with function. So I think in a lot of ways, we're deconstructing church the way God intended, and we're replacing the Jesus way with the American way. You know, I'm a student of church history, and I love what I read, not only in history, but I love what I read of the earliest days of Christianity in the book of Acts. And what we see there is we see a people that and a church that was irresistible. People from outside of Christianity, they were, they were drawn to the fringes of this community, which ironically, and you can read about this in the book of Acts, ironically, the first followers of Jesus, you know what they were called? They were called followers of the way. And even if people didn't buy in right away, there was something attractive about this group of people who had no governmental recognition. They had no uh, civil protections that, that would make outsiders want to look closer. You know what they had? They had the Jesus way joined with the Jesus truth. And in them, it was producing the Jesus life. And that is what was attractive to outsiders. They're looking at it and saying, you know what? The, the way that they're living I want to be a part of that. There's something attractive about that. And I want to challenge you on something, ladies and gentlemen. If, if you're here just to check a box off your weekly list, I really hope you grasp the magnitude of what I'm about to say. Because the church of Jesus Christ is a living entity of men and women who gather from the world to worship and learn the way of Jesus. And you know, you know what we do then? We go back into the world to demonstrate that there is a better way. Jesus did exactly this. He took 12 men and he formed a community to know him. He took 120, poured his spirit into them on the day of Pentecost and formed a community who fused together the truth of Jesus and the way of Jesus to get the life of Jesus. And you know what? It changed the world. And that, I would submit to you, is the goal toward which we press. Now, I, I'm a sports fan. I, I mentioned track earlier. I I just love sports. I love football. I love baseball, basketball. But I'll tell you what I don't get. I don't get the world fascination with soccer. All right? I know it's the most popular sport in the world, but I'm just speaking personally here. There's not enough scoring for me. So I had a conversation with a friend from Brazil one time. And of course, if you know anything about soccer, soccer is the sport in Brazil as it is in many parts of the world. And I asked him, I said, I said, talk to me about soccer. I got, I got to know, you know, what is it about the game that that just it, that makes you guys so passionate about it? And what he told me was really interesting. He said, you know what, John, as soccer fans, we're mesmerized by the flow of the game and how that the goals are attained. It's the anticipation 
of scoring the goal and playing the game the right way that matters. And in that moment, you know what? It clicked with me. And I started thinking about the Christian life. Because for the Christian, the goal is to know Christ, to know him and the power of his resurrection. And the way that we get there is by journeying with him. We press toward that goal. We give it everything we have and we're gonna do it the Jesus way. So here's what we gotta do. We have to make a choice. And Psalm 1 lays it out. Let me, let me read this with you today. Psalm 1. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. And then something beautiful happens when, when, we, when we get this right. I love what the psalmist said. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. For the Lord watches over the what? Over the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked leads rather to ruin. I want to declare to you today, ladies and gentlemen, as we stop and we think about our ways, we stop and think about how we're living life right now, the trajectory of our life, I want you to walk away from this message today knowing without a shadow of a doubt that there is a better way. And it's only when the Jesus way is joined with the Jesus truth that we get the Jesus life. You know, I look back on my life and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that my biggest regrets that I have, the biggest regrets that I have in life, they stem from one thing. They stem from the times in my life when I chose not to follow his way and where I didn't keep the goal of knowing him as my central focus. I asked you at the beginning of this message to ask the question, why are, what made you follow Jesus? Why are you following Jesus? Regardless of why we start following Jesus, Every one of us should all be challenged to shift gears if we find that our ways are truly not his ways. We should all be challenged to follow for what? For eternal life, to know him and experience his life. Why? Not just so that we can say we have the life of God. But you know what I would love to see in all of us is so that that life that God has put in us can flow out of us to a world that is mired in death. The world that we live in needs the life that is only possible through Jesus. But to get his life, we have to walk his way. And so what I'd like to do to close this message out today is I wanna give you an opportunity to respond and to pray with me. If you're watching and you may have never said yes to Jesus before, but something in this message today has challenged you. You feel that God's pulling on your heart. You say, you know what? This, this is my time. This is my moment to, to say yes to Jesus. I invite you to do that today. And, and we're gonna pray a prayer. And you pray this in your own way, in your own words. And Jesus is gonna come and he's gonna live and dwell inside of your life. And he's gonna get you on the right journey. He's gonna get you on the pathway with him, moving towards eternal life, which again is not just a quantity of life, but it's a quality of life. Maybe some of you have been following Jesus for years, but... As you look and you evaluate the ways of your life, you're thinking to yourself, you know what? I haven't always kept the ways of Jesus as my central focus. Well, now's an opportunity for us to shift gears and to recalibrate and get our lives back on the right track. So I would invite you, whether it's for the first time or whether it's a rededication of your life, to simply pray this prayer with me. Would you do that today? Lord Jesus, I thank you for this wonderful day that you've given me. I thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to say yes to you, to follow you. Today, I recognize that you have a goal for us, and that is to know God. But the only way that we can really know God is to know you. And so that's why today I say yes to you. I ask you to come into my life, to forgive my sins, to be the Lord of my life and the leader of my life from this moment forward. Help me find a community of people to surround myself with that I can begin to walk and learn the ways of Jesus so that I can follow this path and this journey for the rest of my life. Today, I give my life to you. 
And I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless you guys. Thanks for watching this weekend. We love you. Wow, I loved that. It is only when the Jesus way is joined with the Jesus truth that we get the Jesus life. Man, I love that. I hope you took notes. If you didn't, you can always rewatch this message. But if you just made that decision for the very first time to accept Jesus into your heart, to pursue after this Jesus life, we would love to pray with you. We would love to know that you made that decision. Maybe even get some resources in your hand to help in this journey of following Jesus. It's an amazing journey and we would love to partner and walk with you in that. So you can go to pureheart.org slash hand raise and let us know that you just made that decision for the very first time or if you're recommitting your life to Jesus after that message. If you've been here with Pure Heart for a while, you know that we have an incredibly talented worship team. They actually just wrote their very own single and released it recently. So check out this next video. Hi guys, my name is Brenna Pavkov. I'm one of the worship pastors here at Pure Heart. Um, on September 17th, we had an awesome night of worship with our Heart Youth Youth Group. It was so incredible to see students just come in on a Sunday night and have a space where they could encounter God and they could worship together. We also had a live recording of our very first Heart Youth single, Nothing Wasted. It was a really cool story, just the testimony behind this song. We really tragically went through a loss as a youth group a couple years ago with two of our leaders. And through that, through the pain, we were able to rally around the idea that nothing is wasted in the kingdom of God, that the pain that you walk through, the waiting that you wait through, God doesn't waste any of it. And he will use all things for the good of those who love him. So we got to rally around that idea. We got to sing this song out in truth. And it was just incredible to see our students responding to who God is and the truth and the promise that we can trust in with him. So as I'm finishing up this journey, and we talked today about our journeys, right, that God has us on, I'm, I'm seeing some castles today by a guy who built them called King Ludwig. And he was in the 1800s, and he had a goal to build some magnificent, beautiful castles, kind of like the one behind me, New Schwanstein. Many people think of that as the Disneyland castle, the Cinderella castle, and that's what inspired it. But what he did is he built all this stuff for himself. He did it for uh, himself to glorify him, to enjoy by himself. Many people couldn't even go inside of them. And I think about you and I in our journey that God has us on. Who are we building it for? Are we building it for ourselves, our life journey? Or are we building it for what God wants us to do? Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week. Well, hey, thanks for joining us with Pure Heart Online, a place where we say it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to pretend and it's not okay to stay stuck. If you recently just began tuning in, we would love to connect with you and find out more about you. Go to pureheart.org slash connect card and fill out a connect form. You can always watch last week's message by clicking the link below.